Heritage Housing Partners. We're a nonprofit affordable home ownership developer, not affordable rental, but affordable home ownership. We have two very, very small rental projects because Bill Wong made me do it. <laughs> uh, but otherwise, um, we, we have developed about 250 uh, ownership units. The other thing that makes us different, in addition to the ownership focus, is mixed income. So our projects have a mix of low income, moderate income, workforce or middle income, and market buyers all living side by side. And that's the case with this project. So for some of you who got the flyers, you can see, uh, wrong project. I don't have any, where's the flyers? Uh, but this is about, this has nine low income, 24 moderate income, three middle income, and four market units. Uh, this project was completed in 2008. Um, in addition to a mix of uh, uh, affordability mix, we have a different mix of unit styles. We saved the old houses that were here. These houses were here on Peoria Street. These houses were sited on Fair Oaks Avenue. So we picked them up and moved them to create the development opportunity there. That new Craftsman architecture is on top of a subterranean garage with 86 parking spaces which I think we did a really good job of hiding the garage. And we used the Craftsman architectural style because if you look around the neighborhood, that's the dominant style in the neighborhood. We also had the density go lower from about 30 to the acre there to about, I don't know, 10 to the acre here. So the density steps down as we go towards the neighborhood. Um, and uh, because we have a mix of, I have a saying that economic diversity equals population diversity. Because we have a mix of income levels, we have a very robust mix in terms of who lives here, ethnicities and demographics and all that kind of stuff. Although I will say that for the most part, our buyers, regardless of income, are, are young families just getting started out. So there are lots of kids, which is why we always emphasize open space. So this is, you know, the big open space that everybody plays in as well as playing in the court, <coughs> courtyards. Uh, this is probably the most successful project we ever have developed. It's 15 years old, but successful in terms of just the, the cohesion within this community. Everybody gets along, everybody, you know, they used to do a, uh, a, a trip, a camping trip every Labor Day, everybody in the community would go uh, rent some campground somewhere. So um, uh, I'm super, super proud of this project and uh, I'll shut up. You know, this guy, I, I said earlier that Bill Wong is like a miracle worker. This is the other miracle worker. Because when I think about how to fund affordable home ownership, there's really almost no funding sources for that. And he's made it work. And it works in the large part because of our inclusionary housing ordinance. Because remember, they have a choice to pay a fee. The majority choose not to pay a fee, but those that do, that has accrued over time over 26 million into our affordable housing trust fund. And um, that's getting very low right now, so we're looking at other dedicated funding sources. But our city believes in the work of, of HHP, Heritage Housing Partners. and. Charles is the executive director of that, so I want you to give him a big hand. If you have any questions, we have a few moments. So, the, yes, so this was the first project in the United States to use a very exotic uh, funding mechanism called New Market Tax Credits. This is the first project in the U.S. to use New Market Tax Credits for housing. Uh, we actually got invited to make a presentation to the U.S. Treasury in D.C. because uh, they were like, how the heck did you do this? So we had to explain it to them. But we've used that funding mechanism, I think, four times since. And so the, there's low-income housing tax credits, but low-income housing tax credits can only be used on affordable rental housing. Mm -hmm. New market tax credits uh, were really designed for economic development and publicly-owned projects, uh, but Heritage Housing Partners, Charles, sacrifice 
thousands of brain cells to figure out how to use this. My, for my hair used ownership. to be brown <laughs> <laughs> until new market tax credits came into my life. So I want to make a quick comment about new, mar new market tax credits. So I've been part of what's called CCDA, Christian Community Development Association. And on the board is an amazing woman named uh, Mary Nelson. And so years ago, she, she had a project in Chicago where they wanted to fund a hospital that was defunct and, trans and adapted into affordable housing. They couldn't figure out how to get it funded. And so she was invited by the president of the US to be part of a task force to figure out funding for affordable housing. It was her idea, the idea of tax credits, and that's written in a book. I've written a book about all of this, it's in there, and it's all about the hospital and all different models across the nation. But the name of my book, if you're interested, is called Making Housing Happen, Faith-Based Affordable Housing Models. But um, it, she also came up with the idea of the, the new market tax credits. That was her baby. So to see it happen here in my own city, it's thrilling. Um, some of you may not know that backstory of my connection to the person who dreamed up the idea. But, um, but we do have an opportunity to hear from the guy behind the camera. And uh, we're going to bring him up. And uh, he has got a powerful story about living here. Yeah, I, I, I'm a recipient of, of living here, and I love it. I, I, thank you. You want, to, you want a mic, <laughs> Kevin? Yes. Yeah. So this is uh, yeah. Kevin. Kevin. Yeah, um, Do you want a mic? Is it no, I, I'm fine. I, it'll pick me up. But I, I, I was homeless for about five or six years. I was pushed out of my old His place. name is Kevin Bruce. And Kevin he works Bruce, for Pasadena yeah. Media. I work for Pasadena Media, uh, the local cable access TV station here in, in the city. And so, um, yeah, I was, I was pushed out of my place. I, I had been living there for like 18 years, actually. And they raised the rent, pushed me out. Uh, fortunately, I had somebody who was like a big sister. She took me in her back room. I was there for like five years. Uh, I was basically a homeless encampment in her back room. <laughs> it was, it was, it, I'm so happy that this happened because if it didn't, I probably wouldn't be here. I'm, it's that, that bad. <laughs> it, it, it was a matter of, um, I had nowhere else to go. Um, and I didn't want to be a burden on somebody else, but I wanted to be able to, to do it myself. I had a full-time job and it made no sense that I couldn't have a place of my own. And Kevin. when this opportunity came by, I was thanking God because for what I make and to live here in the city and to be able to be a homeowner is a miracle. It's a freaking miracle. And if any of you have any questions about having this type of program in your city, don't. Because it saved my life, honestly. And there are people out, out there in the workforce like me that have nowhere else to go, but they can't, they, they work 40 hours, but there's no place that they can afford. And this place is a godsend because I'm paying less in, in, in mortgage than what people are paying in rent. And, and, and anyway, I don't wanna start crying, but it, it, was, it, it, it was a blessing and I am very happy very happy because it regenerated my life because I was on my way down <laughs> but the fact that this place is beautiful I love the way it's designed I love the location and it's just regenerated my life basically so uh, if anybody's had like I said any question of putting this type of program in your city do it because it is worth it it is so worth it for people like me and, and I'm just working class I'm not even talking about people that don't have jobs but people that are working class need homes too and, and and to be a homeowner is a blessing. So that was that's my and Kevin. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so I want, can I say two things really yeah. quick? So the biggest barrier to ownership is the down payment, mm -hmm. but in our pre program, you can own a home for as little as one percent down. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I don't remember the details of Kevin's deal. The only thing I remember is I f it feels like for every day of those five years, Kevin called me. <laughs> and me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was on the first. They were my, my speed dial, both of them. Yeah. And we finally found a, 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 a unit within here, a resale that was affordable at Kevin's salary, and so we made it happen. He made it happen. 
So can you imagine from homelessness to homeowner? What a miracle. Yeah. So so it looks like we've got a comment here. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about Heritage Housing Partners. So Heritage Housing Partners is a homegrown Pasadena nonprofit development corporation, grew out of uh, Pasadena Heritage. Uh, as a separate uh, nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, besides this project here, the next one I think we're going to see is on Lincoln and Orange Grove. It's just a couple blocks away. It was an old abandoned gas station that had been there for Nin decades. 1994. Uh, that has uh, now brand new affordable housing units uh, with retail on the first floor. Those of you who are local uh, know Perry's Joint. Perry's Joint is moving into the first floor wow. over there. And then they have another project just starting construction on uh, Walnut across the street from the from the uh, Honda uh, dealership, and that's another 58 units or so of affordable home ownership, mixed income. And uh, and then recently they've gotten into a little bit of the affordable rental um, project, and so they are now uh, <laughs> developing. Now this is a cutting edge. It's a small project, but it's a cutting edge project. It'll be transitional housing for homeless uh, transition age youth, primarily PCC students. College. Community, college, uh, community colleges have a huge homeless population. And the cutting edge thing there is that Pasadena City College has, has committed to pay the rent for their students that get housed here. I think that's unprecedented. Yeah. I don't think any that's community amazing. college yeah. has stepped to do this. So it's really cutting edge, and that project is also under construction. So we're really glad to have a, 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 a homegrown nonprofit, but they also work in Glendale, they work in Sierra Madre, they work in Whittier, they work in Napa. Uh, so they, they travel beyond Pasadena. So if you have some opportunities for affordable home ownership, you're wondering, is there a way to make it work? Um, Talk to talk to Charles and uh, Heritage Housing Partners. So this so. this was grown out of Pasadena Heritage, mm -hmm. which is a very prominent uh, nonprofit in our city. When you drive around Pasadena and you see all these gorgeous old homes, there's a high commitment to preserving those, and so we keep that beauty and that heritage. And so out of that was born um, Heritage Housing Partners, with the goal to both preserve and create affordability. So we don't have time for too many more questions. I see one more and then a comment and then we need to get on the bus. Thanks. Just about the future, I'm looking at the Thorpe construction right here mm -hmm. and I know that there's something planned for that. Is that part of this development? The so which one? Through. Through, through, through lumber. No, that's no. separate. Yeah. Well, not yet. So, so that's a that's a site of uh, that has been developers have been trying to develop that site for a long time. I think the site is available for sale right now, but I don't know that there's a an affordable housing um, project that has got that site under escrow. I just see this at St. Luke's property. I hear you. With a small historic hospital in the background. Yeah. <laughs> we, need, we definitely need to put some energy. You know, talk about prayer. I'd love to see a whole circle of people around St. Luke's and just lift that place up and see what we can do to transform it. Um, and so, workforce housing on school land. And workforce housing on school land, absolutely. That's what I was just going to ask. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we're doing that. Yeah, question, quick um, question. There's been so many interesting uh, developments in Pasadena that are based on Pasadena owning land and using it for affordable housing is how do we have school districts who have a, a surplus land start building affordable housing on that? You, you, our city has a joint um, city council with the school district mm -hmm. once a year, so there's a relationship that's forming and has been formed, and there's been a high interest in in this because we've advocated for 15 years, I've been going to the, the school district facilities and asking them to do this. At first, the school district was actually selling their land. You should never sell any land, public land especially. It should go into a trust. It should be into some kind of a, a long-term lease. And so, um, so they made the decision that they would only lease their land. And now finally, 15 years later, They've got the, the vision and the courage as a board together to move forward on this. It's not a done deal. They've only had one public uh, initial meeting on that. But not only is 
this an opportunity on school district land, which you all have in all your cities, but church land. And that's what the workshop is about tonight. There's a lot of churches very interested in providing affordable housing on their underutilized land. And that's a strong part of what our nonprofit does. So when you say that we're built out, we have no land, that's just not true. There's land everywhere. There's parking lots where you could consider. There's a lot of opportunities if you just kind of pray and open your eyes to see what doesn't exist. And it's there's opportunities everywhere. As far as you know, can, uh, even if a school district land has already gone through the 7-Eleven process, can it still go into a trust after that? Um, it depends on the decisions of the 7-Eleven and what okay. they decided. Yeah. So <clears throat> one of the things that shifted on the state is that the state passed a bill that would allow uh, affordable workforce housing for staff and teachers using tax credits. Previously, tax credits had to be open to anyone who income qualified, but now under the state bill, they can target teachers and staff. Can you name that bill? Um, Schiff is federal. Schiff is, Schiff is federal. That's no, Adam Schiff. No, no, I'm, it's a state bill that was passed. I get you that information. But it, it, it allows <coughs> um, schools to use tax credits for affordable housing or workforce housing for staff and teachers. Okay, so... Uh, but there are, uh, sorry, there are examples of school districts using land for everywhere. affordable housing. Yeah. All of it. it hasn't happened here in Pasadena yet. I know when I was the county's housing director, we got a, we bought, we, we got a uh, entire middle school. A vacant middle school that was used in South LA that yeah. is now a project like this, 98 yeah. units of uh, home ownership. So, so it does happen. Sure so so uh, Harvard, Westgate, my alma mater, Cal Poly San Luis, they all have housing for faculty. And they buy it from the dis from the, the institution, they, they sell it back to the institution. So they're earning equity while they're serving that institution as a professor. SB4, we'll talk about when we get on the bus. We don't want to run one of the really important things for us to just was to make sure the architectural design kind of fit the character of the of the neighborhood and it felt like um, it fit in you know within the neighborhood one of the really cool features that came out of the community engagement was that there's a walkway along the side that leads directly back to washington park in back of us so that created a really nice amenity and was directly came out of the feedback from the community engagement um, one of the biggest challenges here was the zoning um, was not very uh, supportive of a lot of density. As a single family zone, it would have, you know, if we had scraped the site of the building, it would have only allowed somewhere between 8 and 14 units, and the building itself originally had 46. So that would have been a huge loss of housing, which obviously nobody wants to do, especially in Southern California. Um, so what we were able to do was um, we got grandfathered in to uh, keep the units, but we could not change the building envelope. We had to retain as much um, consistency as possible. So that was a really big uh, exercise for our architects to kind of create a modern floor plan that works for our residents um, while staying within kind of the rules that would allow us to um, retain all the, the buildings. One of the, one of the things that they did, they were able to do was um, combine two units. So now we have 45 units um, to create a really nice community room, which we'll see when we go inside. Um, I was gonna take us inside, but I'll talk a little bit about the units first and then we'll kind of walk through. Um, so you'll see when we go in, we have our property management office and a little seating area at the front. And you know all of our buildings are set up that way so that when residents come in, they feel welcome. There's a presence there, not always on the weekends, but <laughs> during the week. Um, and it, so it feels safe and secure for all of the residents. Um, You'll see when we go through the hallway, there's, you know, it's a, it's a simple layout, residential units lining each side of the hallway, um, and the kind of upper levels have a similar layout. Um, all of the homes here are one bedrooms, which we really love to do for seniors, um, to give them that space, and they're pretty nice, kind of generous layout. They also all have um, patios or balconies, depending on the level, um, so again, giving them that private open space um, is a nice kind of feature. Um, there are 44 one-bedroom units, and then we have a two-bedroom unit for our manager. This building serves seniors that are over 62, so um, it's a great place for them to age in place, a really nice kind of way to create community. And these seniors are all extremely low income, so this, the entire building is 30% AMI and below. We're really able to do that because of the generosity of Pasadena. We have housing vouchers, so that's what 
kind of makes serving that population feasible for us. Um, there are 51 residents living in the unit, so we have a few people in pairs. Um, and although the rents are about 1600 a month, most of our residents are paying far less than that. Um, they only pay 30% of their income, and so most of them are paying somewhere between $150 and $700 a month um, to just keep the housing affordable for them. And those vouchers I mentioned makes up the difference for us, which are really, really important. Um, we have a really diverse demographic here. Our residents speak a lot of languages. We have Mandarin, Russian, Arabic, Spanish. Um, so it's, it's a really cool kind of community for them to age in. And we are 100% occupied, which also means we won't be able to see inside of a unit. Um, but it's really great that this you know, project continues to be a really great resource for this um, neighborhood and for Pasadena. Um, some other amenities we have here, you'll see when we walk through the hallway, there are um, what we call memory boxes at each door. And it's something, it's a box um, that the residents can put kind of unique items in, and it helps with um, kind of knowing where they are, and, and with, as you know, seniors experience memory loss, it gives them kind of a personal way to find their unit beyond just the number on the door. Um, so that's a really important amenity for them. We also have on-site laundry and a nice kind of clean, open laundry room. Um, we have a community room, which we'll see, and then, like I mentioned, the direct connection to Washington Park to really encourage the residents to kind of get outside and, and use that amenity, which is really lucky to have the park on the back of the, the project. Um, when we go into the lobby, I'm also going to just point out for you, there's a really cool um, piece of wood from, I think, from the original building, and you'll see signatures on it. Um, Affordable housing takes a lot of partners. <laughs> it takes really great developers and really great city partners and then a whole bunch of people that help with the financing, the design of the buildings, the construction. Um, and this one was an uphill battle to get to that kind of start of construction. So there's a, a wall in there where you'll see a bunch of people have signed, including City of Pasadena staff. Um, Bill, I didn't see your name on there, but Jim Wong is up there. Um, and so it's just kind of a nice way to kind of celebrate all the people and all of the hard work that went into this building. So with that, um, we'll walk through and, and when we get to, we'll go to the community room and when we get there, I can tell you a little bit more about um, our services program, which is really important here. We might have a resident speak. I'm not sure if he, we're working on that. And hopefully he's available. We'll see if he's available. Um, and then we'll go out to the courtyard and talk a little bit about the sustainability measures here. It's a lead platinum building, which is very exciting. And um, I'll talk about financing too. I'll wrap up with that, <laughs> which everybody likes to hear how we get that done. This is our community room that was created out of two units. And this is really kind of the part of the social programs here at Oakeen, um, at Hudson Oaks. Um, and they're run through our Beyond Homes uh, program. The goal of the program is really to empower our residents. We want them to feel independent and connected to each other. Um, isolation is really something that is important to avoid, especially in senior populations, so that's a big part of the program. Um, you know, there's a services uh, coordinator who works here and is available to the residents um, during the week. And then we also, you know, they hold lots of events, um, like I said, to reduce social isolation, um, as well as provide meals and transportation as needed by the residents and even one-on-one -on -one kind of services um, for those who need a little bit more um, kind of attention and as issues come up and things like that. And the goal is really to allow them to age in place here and remain stable in their housing. Um, so that's really the goal of the program. And you know, we have a lot of partnerships with neighboring organizations, um, the county, different health organizations. So a lot of the work we do is through partnerships. Um, we are lucky here today. Um, I would love to talk more about our resident services program. It's, it's amazing. I'm happy to talk more about, you know, if anybody's interested, they can contact me and um, I can give more information. But we are lucky to have a resident here today, um, Albert. I believe he's been here for over four years and he's just going to speak really briefly um, to us. So thank you, Albert. You have the mic. Yeah. My name is Albert, and I'm a resident. I'm a resident of this complex, you know, for two years. Like you're eating it. <laughs> eating my it's an ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, well, I'm a resident here. I'm very happy here. This is a very nice place uh, in comparison with all these places, you know. And uh, we have nice management, nice services, parking lots. Conveniences, you know, very central to everything here. 
you know, the market, the gas station, the bank. You know, um, you know, I, I can I can talk without this. <laughs> <laughs> so this is anno this is annoying for me. You know, <laughs> and uh, I just wonder, uh, I just wonder the composition of this group. What what uh, what? For instance, where do you belong to? Um, there's a church. Mm -hmm. Where are they located? On Euclid, near the city hall, right across the street. And uh, this lady, this lady, you belong to, you belong, you belong to what? Oh, another church? And, and what is your function in? So, Albert, all of them are here today to kind of learn about Hudson Oaks and what it's like for you to live here. Okay. He wants to learn but, about you. I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah, and but, then the other few yeah, but I, I, want, I want to know who yeah. the, the components of this group So, is, so you know? a lot of the people here are mayors and elected officials. What, what, what's, the, what's the mayor? Mayor. The mayor. Oh, Everyone's a mayor. Where's Mr. Gordo? We have two or three mayors. Where's Mr. Gordo? The city manager's here. City managers, mayors. Raise your hand if, you're anyway, anyway. if you're elected, raise your hand. Elected officials. Okay, uh, great. Thanks. You know, uh, and last but not least, you you people want to uh, ask me a question that will be easy for me. That way I can. Do you have any questions about this complex, about the uh, city, about the. Uh, any questions for Sarah or for Albert? Albert, how much do you pay a month rent? Oh, uh, 30 percent of my income. You know, I, I'm going to explain it very plainly to you. If you make if you make hundred dollars, you pay thirty three dollars. Of course, it's a, it's a percent. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. What else? Yes, ma'am. Do you like the direction of how to do this going for housing, or do you have some other ideas for? Oh, you know, uh, like this uh, group is going to be, uh, uh, going to be in the process of develop more uh, low housing income for the city. It's great, you know, uh, great. So I like that, you know. Who, who doesn't like uh, have the the person that need a place to live for for a bed, for an affordable price for affordable. I think there was one more question, and then we need to have Sarah. Yeah. So, uh, because we're in a community space and they have great services, have you benefited from any of the services that the property has? Of course, I'll be, uh, the first benefit I live here for a, for a very uh, modest uh, percentage of my, of my social security. And uh, we, in this location, we're very convenient, lo convenient located to everything. We have the market across the street. We have a gas station at the Chick fil A down the street, <laughs> McDonald's. <laughs> you know, we had the, the buses going through, going to Washington and going to Lake. And down the street, we had the, the railroad, the train. And yeah, we're very happy here. Of course, I'm very, uh, I'm very grateful, you know, to living here. So, Sometimes residents, sometimes they're a little bit more, you know, a little more, I guess, a little more complain, I guess. Oh, this is, oh, I don't like this color. I wish, I wish this were uh, green. It's, it's stuff like that, you know? But you have to, you have to be grateful that we have this place. And, and, so uh, I, I'm, and I'm very grateful that you people are, are going to make more places like this yeah. in the future. Yeah. Yeah. We have to get back on the bus, but Sarah's just going to close out with one minute. Okay, one minute on financing. Is that what I? Okay. Well, yes, I can see nodding. So, Albert, I'm going to tell them about how we got this bill uh, and all the money it took. I'm going to skip the sustainability stuff, but I will just briefly say, like I mentioned. To leave platinum building when you can reuse buildings like this, that is like such an environmentally sustainable way to develop. So that is definitely something that we and I know a lot of other developers are looking at trying to do more of because otherwise this would have all been waste in the landfill. So 
So really, that was an important part of the strategy, as well as some of the more traditional sustainability measures. Um, on the financing, it, this was a really tough one. We had a very tight schedule to get this building um, fully financed and not lose kind of the transaction and the purchase. Um, and so we were very lucky uh, because of the timing of um, kind of the recession in, in 2008, 2009, this uh, project benefited from federal stimulus money. So this actually didn't use traditional tax credits. It was more like um, a grant to the project and that closed the gap as well as uh, generous financing uh, from the city um, were kind of the really major pieces that brought it all together. The project total was only $16 million, which Today, I just wish we could do that. We are really trying to get uh, project costs down, but um, back then it was a lot more efficient to do our do these projects, Did of you course. Save one six? Yeah. 16 million. 16. That's a great price for this stock. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, it's changed a lot since then, but um, just kind of the overall stack. So, like I mentioned, we really benefited from the um, ARA uh, funding, which was the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. $4.5 million from the city of Pasadena was um, really critical to kind of close the gap. Um, we also have money from the county here. Um, we got environmental rebates and then um, and then the uh, Section 8 vouchers um, that I mentioned that really help with the affordability of the project also help us be able to have some conventional permanent financing. So all of that kind of layers of financing um, worked together to get our construction started in January 2011. We opened in March 2012, so it was a, a pretty quick um, construction process. Um, again, because we reused the building that helped. Um, and, and we've been open ever since, and we're 100% leased up, and that's pretty much how we've been from day one. Isn't she great? And following the bus tour, a special presentation focusing on building affordable housing on faith-based properties. This, as so many others, are keeping the faith that even more affordable housing will come to this area. I'm LaTanya Norton. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of Arroyo Now. Thank you for coming out. Uh, you know, we, we're very fortunate in Pasadena to have a city council uh, that really believes in affordable housing. Actually, generations of council members. I think you met uh, council member Jason Lyon and Jessica Rivas. Uh, also <laughs> and, you know, it's, somebody asked me, what's, what's Pasadena's secret? Well, it, it's not a secret. It's finding people who believe in housing, uh, it's partnering with them. Uh, it's ensuring that they have the full weight and support of our municipality so that they can go out and leverage other dollars from the federal and state and tax credits and all the things that make uh, housing happen. Uh, and so that's what we focused on, is forming partnerships uh, with different individuals, organizations who do this for a living. Um, there was a time in place when the city actually uh, tried to do the, the, the projects themselves. Um, but it's, it works much better when you find competent partners who do it all of the time. Uh, and, you know, I would encourage all of you to pull together um, as a region. Uh, that's how we are going to make a difference, is working together as partners, uh, as a region, to ensure that Nobody's on the street, but everyone has an opportunity to be a successful and thriving member of our community. And when I say our community, I mean our collective communities, uh, the entire region. Uh, we should be the example, not only for the state of California and the county, uh, but we should be exa the example of a region working together to better people's lives because we work together to put the housing in place and the services that people need in place uh, as a region. Amazing, there's no other word. Um, I'm a Pasadenian, uh, grew up here in Altadena, Pasadena area, and to see what the city and through, you know, the collaboration with housing, heritage, as well as the other entities that were discussed, has just transformed this city for, I come from a, the generation of living in Pasadena when there was a large, African-American community, 
25% easily. And to see it down to 8% just breaks my heart because a lot of people were displaced, including members of my own extensive family, because they can't afford it. And so to see now that not only are we bringing back or building housing that's affordable for not just renters, but for first time home buyers, people have an opportunity to come back and have an opportunity to live in their city. I'm extremely excited. I started working with uh, Rabbi Marv Gross way back in the 80s when he was doing this from a very little shack at, at literally Walnut and Euclid and helping to get the, the, the social security and ver various services for those that were experiencing homelessness. So when you say a long time coming, I, he's gone now. I mean, he's transitioned, and, and unfortunately, but he would just be smiling to see all this happening because this was the dream. And everyone working together in partnerships, look, everyone's not going to come along, but we have to move forward. And, and I was happy uh, to be a part of the Mayor Gordo's housing uh, task force. So when we received our housing numbers and our element, we knew exactly where housing would be best situated. Not just, not single uh, family housing, but multi-unit housing so that we could move people closer to public transportation. The last site that we took the tour on, on North Hudson, they said they have a grocery store across the street. They have bus um, on Lake Avenue in Washington. He has the goal line. Everything is right there so that those seniors can receive the services that they need and move around and still be independent. That's the goal. It's a great day for Pasadena. It is, and we got to showcase this throughout San Gabriel Valley. I mean, we have people here from Claremont, Monrovia, Arcadia, Temple City, Montebello. How, how do you partner with the state? Instead of talking about what the state is demanding you do, how do you work with the state? How do you work with nonprofits? How do you work with grants and all these other entities to come together to help your residents, your district, your community to do, we all have a, it's a human right to be housed. Look, and we're all, my sister is on section eight and she lived, she and her family lived with us, my family for seven months in Pasadena trying to find a section eight housing. This was about seven years ago and couldn't find anyone to rent for them. So now, she has an opportunity to come home. That, that's exciting. You know, we, we, and I want my kids, I have three adults, my husband and I, we have three adult sons. We want them in Pasadena with my six little grandchildren. That's a, fan, that's a parent's, you know, dream. And these types of, without the whole, you know, we're gonna take over some neighborhoods, that is not the case. I live in a very established, you know, a uh, ranch style neighborhood here in the city. But that, that does not mean that there's not room enough for other people. To, to enhance the neighborhood. It does enhance. Did you see Mars Place? Who would know that that's low income? It's amazing. What's going on on North Hudson? That's amazing. The other sites that we went to, it fits the neighborhood. It's been a long time coming. It's been a long time coming, um, but there's so much more to do. Uh, I think the, how, the bus tour is to help to inform the community and people outside the community about the work that the Pasadena community is doing, but I think there's so much more that we have to do, um, especially when from last year's numbers to now, uh, our homeless count has actually went up. Um, and not only that, but the prevention of homelessness, uh, making sure that people who live here and work here, they're actually able to afford to stay here and uh, their rents are at a, a, a means where they can afford. And so there's so much work to do, but I think this is a good start to help to educate and inform our community about what is happening. And I hear so many people say there is so much that needs to be done. What else needs to be done? So I think number one, some of it was rent control to try to stabilize rent. Some of it is rent protections or tenant protections uh, for um, unjust evictions. So, you know, at one time we were getting calls and, and emails about evictions that are taking place that um, a landlord wanted their family to move in or wanted a, a cousin or uncle or a, a, a sibling to move in, which means now we have displaced a whole family who's been there this whole time, right? And so just cause evictions, meaning that you either have to be evicted for not paying your rent or going against the contract that you signed. 
Um, so things like that, but also building more affordable housing, right? And not just building more affordable housing, but I also think it goes into accountability. So we have uh, units that are being built in our city, and I believe it's either 15 or 20% are supposed to go to low income or affordable housing, but that's not really um, over, nobody oversees that. And so I think we have to create a process to where someone in the city or an apartment in our city actually adheres and hold uh, these units or these developers accountable to making sure that these units are available to at, either at risk of being homelessness or people that just need affordable housing. It's incredible to see how much uh, the city of Pasadena is doing. Uh, the affordable housing crisis is something that for me, as someone who studies uh, race and racism and systemic racism, is something that is really uh, racially motivated and is a deep part of our country's racist and racial history. So to see Pasadena addressing some of the manifestations uh, that have disproportionately affected black people and brown people, uh, you know, especially as you compare it to other cities uh, that are our neighbors, is, is really encouraging to see the efforts and the steps that are taking place. But we can't forget that this was a problem that was uh, created and started uh, because of racism. And when you think about that population drop in Pasadena from 25% black population to now 8%, uh, it's the faces and the people and the stories that are being displaced that we can't ever forget and take our eye off of. But this has been a very encouraging tour. What does the future hold for affordable housing in Pasadena? I think it's going to continue to be a challenge, obviously. We're going to have to, um, you know, finding land that is affordable, finding the funding, um, but we remain committed. We have a, a pretty uh, solid pipeline right now, and we're just going to keep bringing in uh, new new projects. For me, I think the most exciting new possibility is looking at adaptive reuse of existing buildings. So we look at um, buildings that maybe are not their highest and best use, and can we convert those to housing? You've got to be pleased with today's turnout and outcome. Yes, we're very pleased. We, uh, we were a little nervous a couple weeks ago because we had very few people sign up, but they just started pouring in when we started praying. So it was very exciting. And so to see so many elected officials, 38, here today, that's just a blessing. Well, I've been praying for years that other cities would take up the responsibility of housing those in their homes, I mean in their cities, pardon me. Um, so this is very encouraging. You, had, you even had to turn some people away, the turnout. The oh yeah, we had a waiting list. We had a waiting list. A number of people we had to turn away. Yeah. So, yeah. One of the things that... Um, I, I had a really good conversation with several people today, and um, one one gal was just saying, you know, those folks on the street, they need to get their act together first. They need to first, you know, clean up their act and, and get over their addictions, and then they should get housing. And I said, you know, it's so counterintuitive because they can clean up their act once they're housed. Once they're on the street, it's very hard. It's, it's about Maslow's hierarchy. And, and how do you self-actualize when the basic needs are not met? And sometimes addictions happen because you're on the street. Once you have stability at home, you can no longer self-medicate. You know? It's a holistic approach, and we always talk about wraparound services, but I really want to focus on, and you, and you did it just now, but light bulb moments that this tour hopefully generated for some people because there are a lot of misconceptions, myths, fears whenever someone hears affordable housing. Yeah, um, boy, I really have to thank April um, Verlato who's in Arcadia. She was on a tour a couple years ago and she saw the light bulbs were going on like crazy. We walked into some affordable housing several years ago, permanent supportive housing, and she said, this is gorgeous. We need this in our city and that's in Arcadia. That's, I mean, the housing was not in Arcadia, that was in LA, but she became a champion. And so she brought a lot of her fellow city council members today. She kept calling me this week, she goes, I've got one, one more, one more, you know. So it was very exciting to see her championing this. And a lot of cities that have no affordable housing were here today. So they're having to figure it out. One, one person I spoke to, um, she was a mayor, and, um, and they were talking, I said, well, what kind of homeless services, what kind of housing do you have in your city? She goes, none, we have no housing, but we do have some homeless services. I said, once you've provided services to your homeless population, then what? Do you guys have any housing? 
oh no, we have housing outside our city. And so, so we had a really heart to heart, you know, and she said, I said, you know, we have to be responsible for the people that are in our city. And um, I've been going to the city council here in Pasadena for 23 years, and I have heard countless times from our city council, when are the adjacent cities finally gonna take responsibility and not be sending them all to our city? And so to hear her say, well, you know, you have a good point. We do need to do something. I mean, that was a real light bulb moment for me today, yeah. So many cities don't want to quote unquote deal with it. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's true. But there, there's not a lot of ways to get around it now. Um, we've been able to play a role in strengthening the housing element. We're in partnership with Abundant Housing, who was able to up the requirement of units to be planned for. And that's important because they don't have to build them, but they have to plan for them. So here in Pasadena, we now have to plan for over 9,000 units in the next eight years. And out of that 9,000, that's a rounded number, about 6,000 of those have to be affordable. So that was true in every single um, San Gabriel Valley city. All of their, what's called RENA, Regional Housing Needs Assessment numbers have increased dramatically. And there's now some penalties from the state. Um, some would call them penalties, some call incentives. But if a city is not gonna effectively plan for enough housing for all income levels in their city, and that's, that's what makes a healthy city. A healthy city is when you can have housing for all income levels. All the businesses, all of the folks living there, serving hotels, all the folks in schools, if they all have to drive and they can't afford to live in their own city, then it's not a healthy city. And so, so those numbers have increased in order to create healthy cities throughout all of San Gabriel Valley. And they're, they're having to figure it out. And if they don't meet their housing element and really plan, make a good plan, then something called builder's remedy happens. And that, that means the city loses any chance to have local control. Every city wants local control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they're gonna have some developer come in like what's happened now in Beverly Hills and also in um, Santa Monica when they say, I'm gonna build this big tall building. And the city can't do anything about it because they chose not to plan well and get it done in time for the state. So, so there's, there's, they're up against that. They, they read in the newspaper, they hear what's happening in these cities, and they don't want it to happen to them. So that's why they're here today. They realize that, that there's some pressure on them to have to figure out how to house those people in their own cities. And along those lines, you have developers who have these low-income affordable uh, tax credits right. that will soon expire. Yeah, that's an interesting question because those tax credits last for 15 years. Yes. And so after that, almost always now, they continue. It's rare that they would not reassess and keep those tax credits going. Because they do have the option of going market rate after the 15 years. They can- No, yes and no. And so if you, if you look at what's happening um, in order, like if you and I buy a house, it's usually a 15 or 30 year mortgage. Mm -hmm. But when you build affordable housing, a multifamily full affordable housing development, it will take anywhere from 55 to 65 years to pay that off. That's called the affordable housing covenant, that mm -hmm. period. And so even though the tax credits have ended after 15 years, they have to pay that off. They have to stay in business for at least 55 to 65 years, depending on the length of that covenant. And so they can't necessarily go market rate. Okay. After that 55 or 65 years, yes. So but, the expiration of these tax credits doesn't necessarily threaten the no, number of affordable housing no, units? No, no, not, not at least for that time period. And our city council, I remember when Steve Madison was looking at the Concord and you know, all of a sudden, the Concord in his district, you know, with with 13 stories, and he's proud of that, and that he has affordable housing in his councilman district. But he said, you know, I um, I don't want it to. We don't. We don't want to lose the opportunity here, you know. And and so they 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 
they were able to preserve it so it would stay affordable. And he was he was saying, you know, all of a sudden it's like the the, the 55 years ended and it was, seemed really fast. You know, he says we need to lengthen that covenant and so that it stays permanently affordable. And so that's what we're working on now in policies around the country. So I mentioned our inclusionary policy today. That is permanent. So all of those units that are in developments throughout the city, they will never go market rate. Awesome. They're permanent. And that's what we need to do with all housing. So we believe in a, something called a community land trust. Our goal is to put our own home into a community land trust. And that's permanent, permanently affordable. And so we know that we were given a very generous donation to be able to buy our home at a time when it was below market. It was very inexpensive, 143000 to purchase our home in 1994. And so my parents gave me 20000 each with that 40000 So I, I, I know that we've been given much, so we have much to give. And we want to make sure we bought a house primarily in a black neighborhood, and we want to be able to help African Americans that have had to be played priced out of our city. Yeah. It's either gentrification, they've chosen to leave because they can get a big house and sell for you know, a high price or because they've been priced out. And so we want to keep black families in our city and that's what we want our home to go for when me and my husband pass on. I saw your story online and I saw how you moved into the neighborhood and the, and the taxes went up and a lot of people uh, were unfortunately unable to stay to in stay. that neighborhood yes. and that was heartbreaking to you. Tell me why you do this work. Um, tell me why this is so important to you, because it's about being intentional, about being inclusive. Why do you do this work? Thank you for that question. <laughs> I really appreciate it, because it makes me want to cry. <laughs> I, um, I do this work because I'm called. Um, I have clearly a call in my life by God to do this work. Um, I don't know if you're ever experienced when you have something you can't not think about day and night and you dream about it. Yes. And so this is how it is for me. I have, some people say, Jill, you're, uh, you're obsessed. I don't think I'm obsessed. I think that God is make, making it very clear that I have been called into this work. I initially got started because of the children. I was at Lake Avenue Church for 10 years. During that tenure, I was able, I was privileged to start the STARS After School program, co-founded that with Martha Schenkenberg. And so all these kids, after years of mentoring and pouring our lives into them, and their whole apartments were being, you know, sold out from underneath them. And, and I wanted to see these kids stay in our city, you know? And so I learned about affordable housing. There's a, a wonderful little development called Agape Court. We did not go there today on our tour, but they had openings. It's family affordable housing, and it was in their neighborhood. So I started moving families into there. And every one of those kids, we tracked them. Every kid that moved in there graduated from college. They were the first in their families to ever graduate. And I thought, we need more of this they amazing. Opportunity. They needed an opportunity. And so parents that were working three and four and five jobs to make ends meet moved in there paying only a third of their income. They had time for their kids. And that's why they're doing well in school. And so that's what motivates me, are those children and, and my faith. But it's also my theology. And so, so I have a doctorate. And my doctorate is in transformational leadership for the global city. And so I, I worked under, studied under one of the amazing urbanologists in our country, Ray Bakke. He's passed on now, but I was incredibly privileged to work, to, to learn from him. And so that's when I started thinking about God's intention for land. And, and it's amazing. It's not even a sideline. Throughout scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, it talks about land. It's everywhere. And we don't talk about it in our churches. We don't hardly discuss God's intention for land. But I have begun talking about this for the last 25 years in workshops around this country. And now I hear people talking about it. It's very encouraging. I've written about it in my book. So I've written a book on what churches are doing to address the housing crisis. It's been used on campuses around this country and um, even at USC in their real estate department, which blows my mind. I can hardly believe it. You know, little old me, how could that ever happen? But, but what, what, what I'm 
so driven by is that I believe God has attention, intention for land so that everyone has access and a place, a place to call home. Anything else? Oh my goodness, you're a great interviewer. Um, I, I guess I just have a heart so full of gratitude right now. I can hardly stand it, you know? I just feel like, you know, this, this vision that we've been given is expanding in ways I never dreamed. And so because the process we talked about today that's so honorable that we talk about in this brochure of how to help churches so that there are over 4,000 churches a year are closing their doors in this country. And, and a lot of them don't have to. You know, they can have affordable housing and that's gonna provide some income source for them. And so they can stay alive and they can just envision a different type of church. They might meet in that community room. They might even get rid of their church building. There's all different ways to do church today. And so we are now helping churches to envision what's possible. And so <coughs> word's gotten out. And so with the workshops I've been doing around the country, we, uh, we've had people come to us. We have done no advertising, but we've had people come to us in different states that want to learn what we're doing. So now we're starting congregational land teams in Colorado, in Texas, in Washington State, and Northern California. So, so that's, that is so exciting, I can hardly stand it. I had no idea that our work would expand so dramatically. Um, but yeah, the last thing I want to say is this, is that the church is like a big, giant, silent, latent powerhouse that they don't know the power they have to create change. So most of the affordable housing in this city would never have happened without people showing up and asking for it. There's no law that requires it. It has to be asked for. And so with people of faith, with respect, show up and say, we want it in our neighborhood. That changes everything. And so I want to see every church and every community begin to take up the responsibility of playing a role in shaping their city systemic change through the policies and the projects so that city council members have the courage. They have the courage to stand up. Right now, all they're hearing is negative, but they need someone to say, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. So we do pardon me, we do 1J Housing Justice Institutes. So we've been doing these around the country. So we're doing one right now in Long Beach and in Fullerton. The one in Long Beach is on the 5th of August and the one in Fullerton is on the 23rd of September. And so those two dates are really important to pull the people of faith together to learn, to learn the incredible role they have to create change in their communities. So. Asking, you shall receive. Amen. 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 Thank you so much yeah. for spending time with us, and thank you for answering the call on your life. You're so welcome. I can't not do it. It's so clear. <laughs>